Hello, my name is Neil McDonough and welcome to Ampleforth College, which will be hosting this year's Youth 2000 conference. As we reflect upon John Paul II's famous words to the youth when he said, it is Jesus who we seek when we dream of happiness. And with that in mind, I'm going to be meeting with and speaking many of the youth, many of the future of the church who have made their way to this year's event. Stay tuned. Welcome to our new episode where I am absolutely delighted to be joined by Sister Camilla from the community of Our Lady of Walsingham. And Sister Camilla will be giving the talk on the power of prayer. Sister Camilla, welcome to Amperforth College. Thank you, Neil. I'm very happy to be here. So, Sister, give us a little bit of an insight into your talk. Uh, where did the inspiration come from? Well, I was asked to give a talk on the power of prayer with reference also to Our Lady and the Eucharist. And our community is one of the new forms of consecrated life, um, remembering especially the joy of Our Lady at the Annunciation when Christ became flesh in her. So our whole um, emphasis in giving our talks is to help people allow Christ to grow with them, within them at every level. Yeah, absolutely beautiful. And, and, and Sister, explain to me, how do you encourage people or how do you transmit that people to the youth, the future of the church, uh, that they can go out there in this kind of very complex culture, but at the same time give an authentic witness to Jesus Christ. Um, I believe that if we can transmit the beauty of the Catholic faith and Catholic message to young people in a way that our culture can understand, and in a way that they can experience this joy, that which means then a formation at every level of the human person, um, then we can actually share this with the people of today. Brilliant. And do you mind just expanding a small bit about that? What do you mean the formation on every level of the human person? It sounds interesting. Okay, right. We have to, as Christians, have the mind and the heart of Christ. Mm. So our thoughts and our emotions and our feelings have to be those of Christ. And we often find that even as Catholics who might go to Mass every Sunday, say our prayers, and think that prayer just changes us like that, um, we might find that actually our mind and our thoughts are not those of Christ, but very much of a secular mentality. And hence, we are losing our Catholics at, sun at the weekends at parishes. We are losing our young people because we aren't challenged them enough with the beauty of, of the fullness of the Christian message, yeah. Oh no, it sounds absolutely beautiful. I know I, for one, are very mu I am very much looking forward to it. And um, look, I wish you all the best in the talk and may you touch uh, many hearts. Thank you, sister. God bless you. Um, 
Well, it's lovely to be here talking about the work of God in my life um, and the power of prayer. That's what I've been asked to talk about. So I'm the leader of the community of Our Lady of Walsingham. I was in a convent in Italy. I joined after university. I'm one of the first in the country to be graduated as a nurse. And I'm a palliative care nurse by profession. But in 1985, I went to join a convent in Italy because I couldn't find what I was looking for here in England. And I stayed there 11 years, but I didn't take final vows. It was one of those new communities where you had the full habit, shaved our hair, you know, you had the full veil, um, you had formation, you had lots of apostolate, devotion to the Eucharist and to Our Lady, both of whom I love immensely. Um, but they had a formation that was all about behavior, basically. So they had lots of entries and lots of losses. So what is prayer, first of all? St. Therese of Lisieux said that prayer is a simple glance directed to heaven. It's a cry of gratitude and love in the midst of trial as well as joy. It's a cry of gratitude and love in the midst of trial as well as joy. So whatever happens to us each day, we got to be able to be grateful for what happens, whether it's easy or it's difficult, because God the Father is forming us through everything that happens. So when you get up in the morning, the first thing you do is look in the mirror. No, you make the sign of the cross first. <laughs> make the sign of the cross first to kind of be there in the presence of God. Then you look in the mirror and you say, I thank you, Lord, for the wonder of my being, even if we're all disheveled. Because we are the beloved sons and daughters of the Father. And that is the, the kind of attitude we have to have throughout the day. The feeling I have to live out of throughout the day is that God the Father loves me infinitely. And what he's going to give me today is going to be for my growth in sanctity. Now, the whole purpose of the Christian life, the Catholic life, is to become saints. And I hope that when you wake up in the morning also, you have that desire, you know, prioritize, become a saint. Yes? Yeah? The first thought in the morning, yeah? To become a bit more of a saint. If that's your main desire, then you will be able to welcome reality as a gift of God. If it's not your main desire, trusting that God will give you what you need to be a bit more holy at the end of the day than at the beginning of the day, then life becomes even more difficult. St. Augustine said, pray as though everything depended on God and work as though everything depended on you. So each day, God gives us, you know, you get your physical food, your mums and dads give you the food on the table, you eat what you need physically. Is that right? You look forward to breakfast, don't you, in the morning when you get up, and to lunch and to supper. But each day, God gives us the spiritual food we need to become holy but I often do not recognize it. Our Lady lived constantly in the presence of God, filled with the word of God, so she was able to say yes when God, the holy angel Gabriel, announced to her that she was to be the mother of God. She was able to say yes. Often we cannot say yes to his will in our lives because we're not living in his presence. We haven't got the ears tuned to him. Our prayers are more about Listen, Lord, your servant is speaking. Isn't it? Well, listen, listen, Lord, I want this, I want that, I want the other. Your servant is speaking. Rather than, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Yeah? So, I think to have this, we need to become prayer. Any kind of adoration, the mass, the rosary, lexu divina, devotional prayer, novenas, all those are good there's a hierarchy of importance in that. But they are all there and given to us so that we become prayer. We have to become prayer. Which means that in every moment of my day, I can hear God the Father saying, Camilla, I love you. Teresa, I love you. Neil, I love you. John, I love you. In the measure in which I hear that in my heart, I will be able to welcome each day as an immense gift of God. Okay? 
So St. John Chrysostom also says, it's simply impossible to lead without the aid of prayer a virtuous life. Hence the struggle to live the virtues. Now it is a lifetime struggle, by the way, to become a saint. But you do get people like St. Therese of Lisieux, Blessed Carlo Acutis, and I'm sure there are quite a few amongst all of you here, you know, living already a saintly life. But if we don't have the desire for that, we will not pray for it, and we will not have the tools necessary. Build your toolkit, by the way, your spiritual toolkit, because the devil does not want us to become saints. That's the one thing that he does not want. He does not want us to have a close relationship with God. So you've got to ask yourselves, what is it that's distracting you in your life as students, as workers, as professionals? What is it that's distracting you from building up the desire for sanctity and a close relationship with God? It's an important question to ask, okay? Now, before, well, no, when I graduated and before I entered the convent at the age of 23, my graduation present was a trip around the world. Um, we went to you know, India, Tahiti, America, you know, because round, round travel tickets on airplanes, um, Australia, you know, went to a lot of places. And we went to Las Vegas. Anyone been to Las Vegas? A few people, one or two hands going up, not many. We went there not to go gambling, but to go to the Grand Canyon. Because at that time, you could fly down the Grand Canyon in a little twin engine plane. That's what I did. You can't do it anymore because of, you know, it's falling apart. So we went down to Las Vegas and we, st we stayed in the Sheratons, the Hiltons and all that kind of stuff. And to get to your bedroom and to get to the dining room, you had to pass through the casinos. Okay? You couldn't avoid them in any of these hotels in Las Vegas. And in these casinos, there were no clocks and no windows. Why do you think? Keep people spending their money, yes. And? As long as they want and? No sense of time. No sense of whether it was day or night or time. They were so caught up in the gambling and they had no... They were not in touch with reality. The gambling had become their world. They, had, they didn't know whether it was day, night, night, nighttime, daytime, or whatever. They were caught up in the gambling, you know? So the same can happen for us in a very busy world we're living in, a very secular world, that we can be caught up in so many things to do, we forget what's essential, which is this relationship with God through prayer, for which you need times of prayer every day, times of prayer every day. Otherwise, the grace to live the virtuous life will not be there. The struggle for holiness will get harder. So parents, educate your children. I know in Youth 2000 they do that. Educate children to a life of prayer. We had the rosary in our family growing up every evening. I didn't like it particularly, it's too long. But anyway, that's why we say the fiat rosary now. But anyway, <laughs> that's really easy. Hmm? One of the signs when we don't take responsibility for ourselves is that we blame the devil for everything. No, 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 no. The devil can use our weaknesses, but we have responsibility to grow in holiness and maturity. Human maturity, because St. Thomas Aquinas says that Grace works on nature. It does not destroy nature, it perfects nature. So if I have got emotional or psychological wounds, I need to get some help for those, so that the grace of God through prayer, through the sacraments, will be effective. So if I have got emotional or psychological wounds, I need some human help for that. Because grace builds on nature and perfects our human nature. So our struggle with um, habitual sin can be rooted just in an emotional immaturity. That's why Christian formation needs to change. In my convent in Italy, there was very little charity. And that's why, listen, the habit does not make the nun. The cassock does not make the priest. Okay? There's research being done at the Institute of Psychology in Rome, 
to look at the loss of all these priests when they leave religious life. And our poor diocesan priests, I call them the first 10 years the endangered species. Sorry, Father Bob, Rob, where is it? <laughs> Ordained recently. Um, so, because there's not a formation of the heart at a deeper level. We need that for our young people and for everybody. So that when we pray, we can be real with God. Okay, so we need a formation of the heart. So this research in Italy found that despite going on many retreats, having lots of spiritual direction, you know, having experiences of apostolate, you know, living in community, having lectures, this formation to priesthood and religious life, the heart had not changed hardly anything. So you get ordained, you put on the cassock, you get, take your vows, you put on the habit, and the heart has changed, changed minuscule me, very small, how is it in English? <laughs> minuscule mentis, it is Italiano. Um, in a very minuscule way, the heart was changed. Hence, so many problems in communities and with priests leaving the priesthood. We need a formation in depth, and our dream is that at Walsingham and throughout the country we have discernment centers where there is this formation in depth and accompaniment in depth. That's why we need to thank Pope Francis for what he's bringing into the church. He is so misunderstood. All our popes are a gift to the church for the time that we're in. He is teaching the church the importance of accompaniment. We have to love people where they're at. We give the teaching of the church, absolutely, but an objective formation of the moral law, of catechism, changes people, you know, helps people to grow maybe 25% of their potential. A subjective formation, which is just about feelings and do what you want and let's look at this and look at that without any, you know, teaching or catechesis, makes people turn in on themselves. We need both. We need a formation of the heart and a catechetical formation, and the moral law. So that our prayer life becomes authentic. So our prayer sometimes is not effective because we are not asking things in line with the will of God. And this is where devotion to Mary, saying the rosary, if you can't manage the whole rosary, say even one decade well, meditating on those mysteries, on that mystery of Christ. Because our Prayer even has to be in line with God's will. So learning how to accept his will in our life, I find, is actually the hardest thing. In my years of accompaniment, we're all trying to find out what does God want for us to do, to do, to do. Part of the problem is that we aren't even accepting his will in our life where we're at. Who I am, the gifts that God's given me, my family situation, you know, my work situation. We're not accepting his will in reality. So trying to find his will can become very difficult. And actually the two of them run parallel for many years before we come to the point of surrender. So always when we pray, always put at the end a little affidavit, or what do you call it, a little kind of, I don't know what you call those things at the end, a little postscript, say, Lord, I would like to have this, this, and the other, but only according to your will. You know, add that at the end. And ask above all that his will be fulfilled in your life. That's why Mary could say that fiat when she was asked that great mission to become the mother of our Redeemer. So when you're searching to do God's will, it's already written in the depths of your heart. And that's why you find a spiritual director who has an understanding of psychology, who can help you read your feelings, your emotions, your deeper desires, because the will of God is written in you. It's not out there. It's your deepest desire. Hence, when you pray, if you're doing praise and worship, I always say 10 minutes praise and worship and 20 minutes silent prayer. Because we've got one mouth and two ears. Hmm? So for all the amount of vocal prayer you do, give him twice as much time to listen to that still, small voice in the depths of your heart, because he is there and the answers are already in you. The problem with silent prayer, people are afraid of that because it does bring up lots of our stuff. But God is in that. 
We can't give him all the nice things we do, all the prayers we do, all the good things we do, because that's his gift to us. We can only give him our poverty and our weaknesses. And when we can do that, he will transform the underlying needs and allow me not to fall into those habitual sins. There's a lovely word in Italian called misericordia. Um, miseria and cordia from, from God, the heart of God. The heart of God is drawn to our misery. And this is where we have to love the sacrament of reconciliation because in that, the blood of Christ washes our souls so that when we receive communion, the grace of God can be effective. Have any of you seen um, the news of that recent miracle in Mexico? the Eucharistic miracle in Mexico, I think in the middle of July, that there was adoration like this in a church and they noticed that it was beating the monstrance. There's a video of about 30 seconds. The monstrance, Jesus, in the monstrance, Jesus, his heart was beating. And you can look at it on the internet. This is a real living heart of Jesus. And it's to him that I have to give him my weaknesses. He will purify what's lying underneath. So we have to be comfortable with that. So the fiat of Mary enables us to also always search for the will of God in our life. Then our prayer will be powerful. Because even Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. So if you feel called, you really want to become a nun, and it's not God's will for you, do not do it, please. You will be a pain for you, and you'll be a pain for your sisters. Yeah. The same about priesthood. You know, if you want to, if, and, if, and by the way, if people knew how happy you can be in the religious life in priesthood, there wouldn't be enough monasteries or convents to welcome you all. So, you have to ask as early as possible, does God want you to be consecrated or a priest? Don't wait till your late, to late 20s or early 30s. That's what's happening now. My goodness. We're all old and doddery already. You know, and this is where you've got to ask that reef as a teenager already, Lord, what do you want for me? And be open to both those, consecration, priesthood, or marriage. You know, but if I you know, feel God's calling me, actually, I entered religious life the first time around, and I hope they would send me away so I could get married to my boyfriend. <laughs> so this is where it's very difficult to discern because I knew God was calling me, but my heart didn't want it. And to recognize that the heart to come in line with God's will takes a long time. God does not deceive us. He wants us to be truly happy. He is forming us every day through whatever happens. But I need to read my emotions, read my feelings, and give that to the Lord. And read it in the light of the gospel. So you want to do that weekend with us. We do that weekend. or how to do that. So silent adoration also before the Lord is really important for our prayer life because it'd be like sunbathing. I got this color, by the way, kind of gardening, you know, so out in the open. <laughs> um, but um, it's, it's, in Tahiti, there's some amazing beaches, absolutely wonderful. But those travels around the world are nothing compared to the interior journey from the head to the heart, okay? So sitting before the Lord, even if you don't feel like it, he changes something. He, he works. It's like solar radiation, you know, or you know, the sun that affects you. So don't put your sunscreen on before him. A toolkit so that your prayer becomes effective. Create the climate necessary for prayer. Be real with God. Give him time every day. Start with even five minutes of silence in the morning and increase that to sit with him. Love the word of God. Yeah, Love the word of God. Meditate on the gospel every day. And apply it to your life. When you go to Mass, come in five minutes before. Don't chat with whoever's there. Prepare yourself in silence for the encounter with the Lord during the Mass. Because he speaks in the Mass through the Word of God and at communion. It's the people who make life difficult for us who are our greatest benefactors. And the saints in heaven say their one regret is they didn't have enough crosses in this life. Otherwise, we will not become holy. God wants to see the heart of his son in us when we die so that we can go straight to heaven. That's his will for us. Now, if I don't do this work now, you'll be doing it in purgatory. Okay, so you either do it now 
or you do it in purgatory. It's your choice. And then when you get to the pearly gates, it won't happen what happened to Bob and Betty. Bob and Betty, they loved each other. They seemed the perfect couple. They're absolutely amazing. Everyone thought, what an amazing couple. And then it was Betty died first, and she went to heaven and found St. Peter at the pearly gates. And St. Peter said, to get into heaven, you have to spell a word. And she said, what word? And he said, charity. So she goes, C-H-A-R-I-T-Y. And okay, you can come to heaven, go in. Now Bob, down on earth, was so sad. And, you know, he was heartbroken that his Betty of all these 50 years had died. So he died of a broken heart. He went to the pearly gates and Peter had gone off on an errand. He found Betty. He thought, oh, fantastic, Betty's there. And Betty says, listen, you've got to spell a word to be able to get into heaven. I said, okay, what word should I spell? Czechoslovakia. <laughs> and on that lovely note, what appear, appearances can deceive, okay? So it's what's in the heart. We need a formation of the heart. Say it after me. Oh, Mary, teach us always to say yes to the Lord every moment of our life. Oh, Mary, teach us always to give thanks to the Lord every moment of our life. Amen. The bread of your body, the wine in your blood, sweet communion, you set a table for us. Oh yes, I just met a good friend here, Michael, and Michael is just about to introduce her, himself to us. Hi, yeah, I'm Michael, I'm from Liverpool originally, but I'm currently living in Leicester as a fitness coach. Very good, and uh, welcome to U2000, Michael. So, tell us, what has brought you here to Amplethorpe College? I think Catholic world is a small world, right? So first of all, it's trying to build a fraternity for other like-minded uh, like Catholics. Uh, and then just to try and share the love of Jesus Christ and the Gospel and to learn more about his life and try and go in a deeper relationship with him. Yeah, beautiful, yeah, relationship with Christ. So, what events are you looking forward to today here at the at the conference? Uh, I think, of course, Mass is number one. Um, I think the small group sessions will be good. Um, lots of different topics that I can go into. A lot more detail in areas I'm potentially uh, interested in. So I think that and then um, reconciliation for sure. And then social is always great to meet some new friends. So, yeah. Good stuff, Michael. Thanks for your time, and I wish you a blessed retreat.
So I pray and hope that you've enjoyed everything that you've experienced on today's episode. The wonderful worship, the praise, the testimonies, and of course, the fabulous talk given by Sister Camilla from the community of Our Lady of Walsingham, where she encouraged all of us, the community of believers, to go on this journey of the heart and not to be afraid of a formation of the heart. We'll see you on the next episode for much more. Turn back towards God. Rise up.